Greetings, my beautiful lovelies. Today, we're going to talk about underwear. <laughs> it's recommended in several books of the era that a newly married woman should have at least one year's worth of clothing in her going into her marriage. And looking at the suggested list gives us a good idea in our modern era as to what we need to consider if we are to dress like our ancestors. And I've been on the journey of converting my modern wardrobe into something inspired by history, but also practical and comfortable for my everyday life. The Victorian lady has a dress for every occasion. Well, okay, that's what the books and the etiquette and the fashion tells us, not to mention all the fashion magazines of the day. In her 1816s volume, Ladies Book of Etiquette, Fashion, and Manual for Politeness, Florence Hartley advised, it is best to furnish the wardrobe for at least two years in underclothes and one year in dresses. Our modern fashion sense tells us this might be somewhat accurate. For today, we have jeans and a t-shirt for going to a ball game, including the ball cap, the sneakers, good socks, a rain poncho, or a light jacket. A skirt and blouse for the office, including pumps, stockings, purse, and makeup. And going out outfits that are dazzled up, you know, your purse, your pumps, possibly a nice coat, the little black dress. For lounging around at home, we have pajamas, maybe a loose maxi dress, slippers, and sweats. For the gym or other specialty sports, the outfits that go with those activities. And all of the superfluous accoutrements that go with those activities. We do need to address the practicality that clothing was expensive and not much of it was ready wear. That's a blanket statement. I do know that ready wear clothing became available in the Victorian era. A woman who was expected to make a great many of her things, especially if she were not in the upper or middle to upper class. In converting my modern wardrobe into a more historically inspired one, the biggest feature I have found needs constant attention is my underwear. In the costuming world, it's often discussed that you must build your look from the skin out. You will see costumers talk about your chemise or smock, and then a corset, a corset cover, sometimes bloomers or combinations, all before discussing the gown and those layers. But usually, because many costumers are building a one-off garment, having many of one item is not necessarily essential or even practical they may not be converting their entire wardrobe into a historically inspired wardrobe. The thing is, if you're building a daily wear historically inspired look, you must address the amount of small clothes or underwear to build from. For example, I have now made at least four different corset cover designs before settling on the one I like, but I only have three that I wear regularly which means I still need to make four more to have enough for a full week of daily wear. And how many videos do you really want to see of me making corset covers, right? So I dove it down the rabbit hole of what would have been expected for a woman to have in her trousseau to give the hints of what I need to look for in practical needs for my wardrobe. So let's look at underclothing or under linens or small clothes. The Victorian woman wore an extraordinary amount of underwear. Basic items consisted of a chemise, drawers, corset, corset covers, several petticoats. In general, these main garments remained pretty staple throughout the period. Some things were taken away and added to like crinolines, bustles, corset covers and combinations. Fashion columns of the 19th century often call lingerie underclothing or underlinens. Small clothes was a term used even further back in history. Underclothing can be separated broadly into two kinds, underlinens and structural garments. But it is important to note that the Victorian didn't really distinguish the difference between the two. Under linen protected the valuable corset and the dress um, and the outer clothing from the body's oils and sweats, etc. Structural underwear, such as corsets, bustles, crinolines, and bust improvers, created that fashionable silhouette. Because I'm going for a historically inspired wardrobe, some of these things for me are necessary and some of these... What was the underlinens or your underwear made out of? 
Underwear was relatively plain and utilitarian during the first half of the 19th century. It did become progressively more decorated with lace and embroidery during the second portion of the century, culminating in the glorious explosion of frilly, frothy petticoats and chemises and combinations that you've seen many of my fellow costumers make videos of. Early Victorian underwear was very plain and utilitarian, made from firm white linen, though cotton was emerging as an alternative. Everything was hand sewn and trimming was kept to a minimum. As the century progressed, cotton became to re came to replace the linen and it was considered more affordable of a fabric for everyday wear. In the first half of the 19th century, over-decorated underwear was considered extravagant or even immoral. Underclothing became progressively more decorated during the second half of the century. Mostly is contributed to the rise of the sewing machine, making affordable machine-made laces and other decorations more affordable for the common person. What does the underwear consist of? Well, you have your chemise or your smock that's next to the body. And over the Victorian era, that changes a little bit and you start to find knitwear also next to the body. Drawers were worn next to the body or crotchless underwear. The corset was put on over the chemise and drawers to shape the figure. Then you had an under petticoat that was worn over all of this. And sometimes and often you had a second or third petticoat. And then you put on your garment. And this could have been a skirt and a bodice, or it could have been a gown. Okay, so let's talk about your chemise or your the thing that goes next to your body that absorbs all of your sweat. It is, so the early Victorian chemise or shift is voluminous and made from white linen and usually undecorated undecorated it was short sleeved or calf length sometimes it had little sleeves at the end of the century the chemise became more simply cut sleeveless garment with narrow shoulders or round square or v-shaped neckline it was however highly decorated with lace and embroidery and made from fine cotton or silk one of the things that i have found in my historically inspired wardrobe is that i am woefully short on the chemise i am woefully short of smocks so that is something that I definitely need to correct. And it is probably one of the most boring garments to make. I don't know about you, but white on white, straight seams, nothing to decorate it, nothing interesting going on is so boring. <laughs> so I have a hard time making myself make this particular garment. Drawers, which you've seen <coughs> if you go back through my playlist, I have actually several videos on drawers because um, I have worn drawers, split crotch drawers now for about five years under all of my gowns and dresses and they're starting to wear out. I do have seven pair, eight pair, nine pair. I have quite a few, but I only have four that I can wear because the others need patching and repairing. And back to that previous statement about white on white garments, I really don't like wear making them because they're so boring. Early Victorian drawers tend to come down to below the knee. Each leg was finished separately and joined together, the waistband. Later in the period, you start to see drawers getting shortened to knee level and they often had knee bands and a hip yoke. And the style of drawers that I prefer for my history bounding wardrobe is the one with the hip yoke. I like that the gather goes a little bit lower on the hip and it actually pads that hip really nicely to give that look without having to add a bum roll because I like that. Combinations were a exactly what they say they are. They're a combination of a chemise and drawers and they fit smoothly underneath your corset. They didn't have a lot of darts. They were a fashionable silhouette. They, they reduced bulk. I'm not big into combinations, mostly because I have short-waisted and a large bum and I haven't figured out a pattern that fits, that fits right. So I don't use combinations. Though, I will say that I am dangerously close to experimenting with some knit fabric and making a set out of knit. 
because that stuff stretches and I might be able to get the size that I need. So the petticoat is next. It had a dual role as both an under linen and a structural garment. So the petticoat that you wear over your drawers, the petticoat that you change every day, at least I do. I change my chemise and my drawers and my petticoat with every day. So I need seven of all of those things. Uh, currently I have four petticoats that I wear. Now, something that's interesting about the petticoat is that your over petticoats were often flannels in the winter time for warmth or quilted petticoats for warmth, or you would have silk petticoats for decoration that might show a little bit underneath your skirt. Um, there were lots of range in your petticoat. So if you had a petticoat that was a really nice fabric, that one would go over your under petticoat. Um, it was one that would show your under petticoat or your ones that you changed more frequently were linen or cotton. Um, so another type of petticoat that I've been reading about is called a petticoat bodice and so your petticoat was actually attached to a bodice type garment or like an over almost like a corset cover that's attached to your petticoat and it was considered an under petticoat and you could wear that underneath your corset but i do have both documentation that it was worn under your corset or worn over your corset and I'm curious to make one. I've, I've come awful close to making one. And that might be an interesting video uh, along with the knit uh, combinations idea. So the corset cover, cover was either waist length or longer, front opening and fitted to the figure by means of front darts and sometimes curved side and back seams. The cut reflected the fashion and could be sleeveless, short sleeved or long sleeved. Not only did the corset cover protect the dress and the corset from each other, but it provided modesty in summer, gauzy, lightweight dresses that were worn. Under vests are listed in a lot of the trousseau listings. Um, and a lot of these trousseau listings say you need five of them. And it took me a little bit of digging in some Harper's Bazaar magazines to find what they meant. And I found actually a picture and I will link that. Um, they seem to be made mostly of woolen flannel. Some are mentioned to button down the front, others go over the hips and they go over the corset cover for warmth and underneath your gown or your bodice or your shirt waist. So it is kind of like um, an internal sweater uh, but it was made from wool flannel as far as I can tell. I have seen a few that looked like they were knitted, um, but it's hard for me to tell where they go in the layering because it doesn't really say. Um, corsets are an essential garment. They create the shaping of the figure and the required silhouette. No fashionable or indeed respectable woman went without one. There are a plethora of videos on corsets, so I am not going to go into detail in this video. Suffice it to say that sometimes I wear one and sometimes I don't. <laughs> Bustle is the one thing that I'm not going to add to my wardrobe at least unless I have a specific desire in the future to make a specific early or late bustle era dress. And right now that's not part of my history bounding wardrobe. So we're gonna kind of skip over that, but a bustle would be normally a part of that. Bust improvers are interesting. They enhance the bust when the fashion demanded it. They range from light padding on the inside of the bodice. So usually around here in the 1840s, filling up the hollow below the ridge here or they were sometimes wire domes in the 1880s, which suspiciously look like wire bras. <laughs> I look at bust improvers as something that give me a silhouette when I need it, but usually if I'm wearing a corset, I don't need the bust improver.
Okay, so recommended trousseau. This is the detailed stuff, and I dug deep into this, and I went through several books, several um, inventories in different magazines, um, several books on live, online in the archives, and this is kind of what I came up, what I decided that I probably need to be going in the direction of for my history bounding wardrobe. So the trousseau says you need six linen and six muslin chemises. And your linen chemises are made of fine Irish linen with a yoke or band that's trimmed and six plainer muslin chemises that are trimmed possibly and some have embroidered bands, which I think that's this is interesting because embroidered bands might mean woven trim or it could mean that you hand embroidered white on white work or black work. There's so many different types of decorations out there. And I think it would be interesting to, for me to have a purpose to build some chemises and do the decoration because that's the one thing I can't stand. White on white, straight seams and nothing, no decoration. <laughs> so according to this, you need 12 chemises according to the trousseau. I think I could probably get away with seven or eight um, and I would prefer linen. The muslin ones are intriguing. I do have two cotton chemises and I don't like them. They don't wick away the moisture as well as linen does. Linen has an antimicrobial wick away prop, um, property and uh, cotton muslin sticks to the skin. So if you get wet or you get cold, you just get colder and wetter. It's icky. And in the summertime, it's yuck. <laughs> okay, drawers. The trousseau recommendation is six pair of linen drawers and six pair of muslin drawers. The linen drawers are to be tucked and finished with embroidery, edged with lace. And the muslin drawers have a neat edge at the bottom and maybe scallops or some pretty edging. It is noted in the trousseau that your chemises and your drawers should be a matched set at, to be worn together. My underwear is my underwear. I'm not worried about my underwear matching. Some people are, I am not. So I'm just gonna continue to build out my wardrobe. Interestingly, night dresses are listed in the trousseau. Six fine made of cambric with deep yokes, trimmed and edged and finished at the wrist. Six plain, they can be made with yokes or a sack pattern with a pretty finish. Now, as far as I can tell, the sack pattern is kind of equal to your robe or something that you would throw on to go to the bathroom or run downstairs to do something. But it's interesting that you should have six of each, like they have to match. And I don't think that the plain everyday woman would have that as part of her wardrobe because that's a lot of fabric and that's a lot of it. Um, I could say that possibly six night dresses, but maybe only one robe, maybe one sack. And we're back to under vests. So it says five under vests made of wool flannel. Ladies who like a low neck open vest with no sleeves will be pleased with this. It is knitted in two pieces, front and back being ribbed fits perfectly to the figure. It is trimmed around the neck and arm armholes with crochet border. Uh, six corset covers, three made of cambric edged with lace, three plain muslin or linen trimmed with neat edging and pearl buttons. Buttons down the front should be mother of pearl or gold shirt studs. It is important the corset cover be long enough to cover the entire corset and run a drawstring at the waist to allow the shirt to hang loose. I think that's really interesting because the I've, I've like I said before, I've tried many corset cover designs and a lot of them do have kind of almost like a peplum at the bottom, like a skirting. They're fitted and then they have a skirting and then a drawstring at the waist and they don't fit me. They don't fit well. I'm not comfortable of them. They often ride up and get tangled in the back. Um, I actually really much more enjoy the very fitted pieced corset cover. The one thing that I will say about my pieced corset cover, I've made two so far that I really like. Um, it does need to be a little bit longer in the back because it doesn't cover my corset completely in the back. So petticoats, recommended six petticoats, three tucked petticoats, one black petticoat, two petticoats plain, 
and two flannel petticoats, one white and one colored. I think it's really interesting. That's seven petticoats. That's a lot of petticoats. But if you think about it, if you're wearing a petticoat up against your skin over your drawers, or not up against your skin, but over your drawers, and you have then your layered petticoats that are decorative or serve other purposes, like the shape of your skirt to hold it out the way you want to, you're going to need a couple different kinds. I think it's really interesting that the flannel petticoats are both in white and in colored. So you get a little bit of splash of color there. Tucked petticoats, interestingly enough, from what I've read, the description on those means that you're putting pin tucks along the bottom. So it creates a decorative edge, but it also allows you to raise and lower the height if you need to as you adjust for fashion. So I think it's really interesting that they build that into the trousseau requirement. Hose is the next thing. One dozen pair of heavy cotton hose and one dozen pair of fine thread hose. So heavy duty cotton just as your everyday wear and your fine thread would probably be your nice silk hose or your fine cotton hose. Shoes is recommended. Two pair of walking boots, a pair of waterproof with heavy soles, dress slippers for housewear, evening slippers for dancing, and two pair of gaiter boots, one pair light and one pair dark. So gaiters are part of my future projects to add to my wardrobe. It's the one thing that I know I need because I do wear fairly modern shoes because they're comfortable and I'm all about comfort. I love my historically inspired wardrobe, but it is based on comfort for me. So gaiters are part of my repertoire to add in the future. I just haven't gotten there yet. Gloves, six pair of kid gloves, two pair white for evening, two pair of light for walking and two pair of cloth for the season. <laughs> There are several books all about wearing gloves in the Victorian time period. And I happen to love making gloves. I have a basket of half gloves that they don't have fingers on them. They just have a thumb and they go down the wrist and they're for warmth. Um, I worked in an office a couple years ago that was really cold. And my hands were cold all the time. And so I think I made probably about 15 pair and I still have those. I don't wear them as much right now, but I love making gloves and I made them a fashion, fun fabric, plain linen and all kinds. So gloves are a fun thing. And I highly recommend that if you'd like some kind of hand stitching work, that's the best. Collar and cuffs. This is interesting because I know that chemise sets are very popular in the Victorian period to wear with your bodices and with your shirts. And they come in all different kinds, shapes and sizes, decorations. Um, there's a couple people, which I will link below, that have done some amazing videos on making chemise sets or placed in collars. I haven't really dove down that rabbit hole, truly. I've kind of dabbled in it, <laughs> but I haven't really dove down into the depth of this. So it is something that I do need to explore. Collars and cuffs, according to the trousseau, recommends six sets of linen collar and cuffs for morning wear travel made plain, six sets of lace or embroidered cuffs and collars. I think that's interesting. So your cuffs and your collars are a set. I didn't know that. Handkerchiefs, one dozen plain and six of fine embroidered. A wrap for spring and one for fall. Three hats, one of your best, one for general, and one for evening wear. I think that's really interesting because I have a whole bunch of hats. I have winter hats and I have summer hats and I'm making another hat. <laughs> I love hats. Veils should be provided to match the hat and make sure you have one of black. Veils were ubiquitous as far as I can tell with hats. They had all different kinds of veils. They were worn to keep the dust off your face. They were worn to keep the soot out of your mouth and also the sun because you didn't really want to get sunburn. Now we're looking at in the trousseau, what are the gowns? So I'm going to briefly kind of talk on this, even though this video is mostly about underwear, this is where your underwear, what your underwear supports. Um, they recommend two white dressing 
gowns and two flannel dressing gowns. And these were used and considered more useful than a shawl or a wrap. And they had that Watteau pleating in the back, so they had a little bit of fullness and yet fitted, and they were also decorative. Wrappers, they recommend you to have two wrappers. Uh, you could have them made of French chintz or cashmere, according to the season. Gray fabrics were preferred, actually. Trim to suit. You could make a wrapper that has more padding to it, warmth. Um, it was for wearing around the house. It was for doing housework. It was not worn out. It was not worn out in public. If you're building your basic wardrobe, there's some basics you need to take into consideration. What are you going to wear around the house? I have a wrapper. Um, I've actually made two on my channel and I have three. I have a green and white check one. You've probably seen many videos of me wearing. I have my blue one, which was a polonaise adapted dress to make a house dress. And then I have this uh, natural form era wrapper that I made from a truly Victorian pattern. So I have three house dresses, three wrappers. I don't wear them out in public. They're just comfortable for me to wear at home, working in the studio, hanging out on the couch. Um, they are great for doing dishes and housework and all that lovely stuff, but they're for home and they're comfortable and I don't wear them out. In the trousseau, they recommend two morning dresses, two afternoon dresses. I will say that a common person probably isn't gonna have that many. The trousseau lists often recommend a waterproof suit, so something that you can wear out when it's raining. They recommend one evening dress, a traveling dress, and one outdoor outfit. Outdoor outfits are their own compilation and there's a whole bunch of different kinds. So there's your seaside dress, your bathing dress, your hiking dress, your hunting dress. I mean, there's a list of different kinds of outfits for different activities. In our modern era, we are quite privileged. We have a little bit of everything to go with everything because we live in an era of fast fashion. I am moving away from the era of fast fashion. I am moving backwards in time to where I am making clothes that suit me, suit my lifestyle, and that are comfortable for me to wear. I'm in a place of privilege where I can look and try different patterns out with, with different kinds of fabrics to find what suits me. Because there's also stuff that's been lost over time. We don't necessarily have access to those fabrics. So just taking that into consideration, um, I've talked about it a lot of times before. I make all of my mock-ups out of recycled sheet material I get at the thrift store. Like I don't buy cotille muslin to make all of my patterns from. I don't do it because I don't have the money. I might be in a, in a culture of privilege, but I don't, I'm not made of money. Looking at your Victorian historically inspired wardrobe, for me anyway, my wardrobe is a little bit of a combination of history inspired by the Victorian era, but I also have garments that I really enjoy wearing that are inspired by the medieval era. They have no laces, no buttons, no hooks, no anything, and they are so comfortable. Because we are in an era of fast fashion, the assumption and our modern sensibilities want it to happen like that, but that's not how this builds. I have been building an historically inspired wardrobe over several years, and I am continuing to work on it. I've had patterns that work great, and I have patterns that work not at all. That takes time. It takes trial and error. It takes making something and wearing it for a while, really sitting with how that fits. Is it comfortable? Is it something you can wear day in and day out? And a lot of times I have found not necessarily so. Just because it's a historically inspired garment doesn't necessarily mean it fits you and your lifestyle. What I really want you to get out of this video is that when you're building a history inspired modern wardrobe, take your time. Don't worry about having all of the everything all at one time. And understand that we live in a time that not everybody has access to historically authentic fabrics. Don't worry about that. Most of my underwear are cotton sheeting fabric. 
and what I have had access to. Scrap linens. Some of my some of my stuff is funny colored and in two-tone colored because that's what I had left over from another project. Understand that it takes time, be forgiving, honor yourself, honor where you are in the world. And if this inspires you, great, but don't feel bad if you don't have all of the everything. Take your time. You know, this wrapper that I love, it's my new favorite, this whole garment, was carefully planned. Take your time. You don't have to spend a lot of money out to make something that you're comfortable in that you enjoy. Each step is a small step that will get you there. If that's what you want to do, do it, but take your time and don't feel like you have to make all the things at one time because you really don't. I've been building on this for years and I'm still working on it. And that's the way it works. So thank you for watching me and learning a little bit about what our Victorian ancestors considered necessary as part of a trousseau to help me investigate what I need to start looking at to really round out my history inspired daily wear wardrobe. <laughs> Underwear was relatively plain and utility under vests were mentioned throughout inventory lists. It seems to have been mace under vents. Oh. That was kind of a rant to the side, sorry. And because it is an era 